Getting a top leadership role in just about any country is likely to be a battle with endless campaigning, unrelenting scrutiny from the press, and for their spouses who become first lady can be even harder as individual identity can often get lost. And as the First Lady of Iceland, Eliza Reid, describes that that can make for an incredibly weird job. In a New York Times op-ed last night, she wrote, As a First Lady, every workday is blessedly different. The thrill of being able to give back to the society that welcomed me 16 years ago has yet to diminish. Yet, there is one persistent expectation that tends to follow me and others like me wherever I go, that I play the role of genteel sidekick. Joined now by First Lady Eliza Reid, who's much more than a sidekick, a writer, co-founder of the annual Iceland Writers Retreat, and special ambassador for the World Tourism Organization. It's an honor to meet you. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks for inviting me. What are you doing in town? I'm here to deliver a TEDx talk on this topic of uh, being a First Lady and sort of outdated expectations, things like that. Oh, just give the talk then. Forget the, <laughs> forget the question. So uh, you wrote things like, women like you are treated as props to support their husband's political agenda. I love this one. Their husband's handbag. That sign of thing. You know what I found so surprising about this? What I know of Iceland is this is the home of gender equity on steroids, practically. <laughs> so how there does this kind of thing happen? It, I mean, it happens everywhere. And I often say, even though Iceland is often ranked and has been for 10 years the best place in the world to be a woman, if we say that that's the best place, say, <laughs> that's as well as we've done, we've got a lot farther to go. Um, and, you know, a lot of it isn't too bad, but it is that expectation, that feeling all the time that all of a sudden you're known primarily as somebody's spouse. But, they, but you know, when I was reading your piece, I was saying to myself, it's as much a function of being a, a woman as it is being a woman in that position. Am I, am I not right? I think so, probably. Uh -huh. and, and certainly got a lot of feedback after that story came out from women primarily who are married to ambassadors, ministers, all kinds of roles like that. So you mentioned an Instagram uh, video that the <laughs> president of the European Council had posted. I thought you were being hyperbolic, but I then looked it up. Here it is. And by the way, we didn't have the wind sounds in the background, which make it even better. One of them is the wife of the president of France, leader of Japan, leader of France, and the head of the European mm -hmm. Council. What was your reaction? when This is at the G7, right? It was at the G7. What was, this, what was and your reaction? And I just saw that post. And again, I thought, here are women who, you know, one assumes are, are you know, intelligent beings with their own ideas and missions, and they're really being reduced to props, mm -hmm. um, you know, f as I wrote there, almost for their husband's political agenda or this idea that the lighter side of the force as if they're there to provide a gentler side while the men take care of serious business. And it, it's just a, such an antiquated expectation. So it, it, what's your least favorite question? Who's taking care of the kids while you're in Boston? Is that right up there? In the, <laughs> I get that all the time. I figured Absolutely. you would. I've So I'm not going to ask that question. No, don't so don't worry that. about it. So what's the solution so that you're not your partner's accessory. When I was reading your mm -hmm. piece, and I didn't know you were coming at the time, mm -hmm. I'm saying to myself, well, isn't this an anachronism? Why do we even need mm -hmm. the position to begin with? If there's a project you want to work on mm -hmm. that as the spouse of the leader of a country, then work on the project. Mm -hmm. Why do we need a first lady? Well, this is exactly... Uh Another part of my point, I think it's it's really up to people's individual choice. You know, as First Lady in Iceland, I'm not obliged to do anything. Mm -hmm. To me, it's a privilege and an honor and something that I really enjoy and I want to be active. But the way in which I'm active uh, is the the image that I'm trying to portray is as someone who also has her own opinions and voice. So what I try to do a lot, you know, and that's my own personal choice, is do a lot of speeches, for instance, so that I'm talking and showing and, and so that people see that I'm not just standing silently next to my husband. And the fact actually that I'm an immigrant in Iceland is extra important to me because I speak Icelandic with an accent, of course, and it's important to give that message across as well. That You're from Ottawa, right? I am no, from Ottawa, okay. Canada okay. originally, yeah. So are there first ladies who I would know of who you would consider role models through history? Are there? Gosh, I mean, I have done a lot of reading on first ladies, and I guess various American first ladies are people that we read a lot about and hear a lot like, about, like, um, like Eleanor Roosevelt, for instance, mm -hmm. who's been Good so choice. so active. Um, and, you know, I've had the opportunity of, of meeting various first ladies in my job, not too, too many, but some. And, you know, they're all really interesting, of course, with their own issue areas and, and their own characters and personalities. Do they all say the same things you say, at least in private, about the job um, or about the position or about the whatever it is? I can't say that I've spoken to all of them about those topics, but out of the ones that I've spoken to about it, yes. I okay. Can we change gears and talk about Iceland a little bit? Absolutely. I looked it up. You're either the 178th or 180th most populous country in the world.
But I would argue you have some lessons to teach the most powerful country in the world, namely us. I picked up on three. Okay. One, I want to talk about, you were the first country to have a democratically elected woman as president. Was that 1980? 1980, Am I right about that's that? right. Well, mm -hmm. you probably know we've gone 240 some years and haven't gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. What's the lesson? What are we missing? What do you have that we don't? Gosh, I mean, I think back in 1980, that was uh, also luck. Again, it was a hard fought battle for her and the fact that she was a woman. Um, and I think the more women that we have in public spheres and public roles using their voices and talking, the more, for lack of a better term, that kind of normalizes it. We, you know, visibility and representation matter. So and we, we, we mentioned a minute ago, you are literally, Iceland is rated number one in the world mm -hmm. in terms of gender equity, pay disparities, that sort of stuff. I mean, what's, what's the cultural thing that caused mm -hmm. you to be well, people, so far ahead of us? Right. Well, people know in Iceland that gender equality is a conscious choice. It's not something that just happens out of its own accord. And I think people realize that we see in all the indices, countries that are more gender equal rank higher on life expectancies and economic performance mm. and peace indexes and things like that. So it's better for society as a whole. And gradually in Iceland, we introduced uh, legislation and laws that facilitate that. One of the major ones is when, for instance, paid paternity leave was introduced. So in Iceland, not only do women get three months of paid paternity leave, but men also mm. get three months of paid paternity leave. And you leave. mandate what well, percentage of women on public boards and that sort of thing, do you Th not? That's right. Love that. Mm -hmm. Number two on my list, and I'm obsessed with this, okay. we, spent, we sent nobody to jail for the financial crisis of 2008, <laughs> except you sent everybody to jail. I mean, uh, I mean, the bank chiefs, the big boys, I think they were all boys. Am I miss, were there some women in there too? There were some women who helped clean up the mess. Okay, so the big <laughs> boys and went to jail. I mean, is that a law differential or is that a cultural differential? I think a lot of that, that's both. And we're a small society and everybody knows each other. And so when things like that happen, it really hits home on a personal level. It touches everyone in some way. And I think for that, people really, really wanted to work to fix that. Okay, well, people in America, number three, are not very happy right now for a whole variety of reasons. We'll leave to another segment. You're the second happiest country in the world. What's the trick there? I think all of those things. You know, we try to treat everybody as equally as possible, have a, an open and welcoming society, try to make society better for those who need it and those who need help. And everybody tries to chip in and do things together. We've got a lot of work to do, but we're doing our best. Well, the reason I'm doubly glad to meet you is not only because I was interested in meet you because I'd read your piece, but there's a rumor <laughs> floating around. I was hoping okay. that you could either dispel or confirm. The rumors are that Donald Trump has been speaking to your husband about buying Iceland. Is that true? or is That, that... was Greenland. Oh, it was close enough. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, I was no kidding, by the way. Yeah. It's a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> Congratulations on a wonderful piece. And Thanks good luck for having in Boston. me. It's really wonderful to have you.